On Tech News Today, Facebook takes on Snapchat with messages that self-destruct. Plus, Twitter rolls out a new GIF format with forward and back controls, and Google's self-driving car got pulled over in Silicon Valley. But there was no driver to give a ticket to. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, November 13th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Braintree. Looking to set up payments for your business? Braintree gives your app or website a payment solution that accepts just about every payment method with one simple integration. Plus, Braintree will give you the first $50,000 in transactions fee-free. To learn more, visit BraintreePayments.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is Mashable Senior Tech Correspondent, Christina Warren. Hey, Christina, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Now, Christina, the Unicode Consortium is considering an official pancakes emoji. Christina Warren, your thoughts? I'm so excited about the potential for pancake emojis. Uh, in addition to, to pancakes, other uh, suggested emojis are eggs, uh, glasses of milk, kiwi fruit, peanuts. Um, but really, I mean, it's all about pancakes. Um, this would be an addition that this is just a proposal. So it, it will be, it, there's not a guarantee that this will actually be part of the uh, uh, Unicode 9.0 specification, which is due out in May. But uh, fingers crossed, we may soon have pancake emoji because that would be huge. Um, this would actually join already some of the suggested emoji for Unicode 9, include things like uh, the shrug, nice. uh, selfies, and um, a, uh, a, a few other things. So um, there's already a lot, bacon, bacon's a big one. Bacon's nice. already, uh, is also on the proposed list. So, I mean, honestly, like we have pancakes emoji, uh, pancake, bacon, eggs, like, come yeah. on, guys. Like, we got breakfast. Breakfast in emoji form, which I think is fantastic. Breakfast all day, just like McDonald's. And I'm hearing yes. the sources tell me that the Canadian uh, government is lobbying for the, uh, the the maple syrup industry there is lobbying for the pancake emoji. Just kidding. They're not doing that. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. That you know what? It would be ridiculous, except, you know what? Justin Trudeau is already proving himself to be, like, one of the greatest leaders, leaders of our time. And he's so hip and he's so amazing. I could see a Trudeau, uh, you know, um, um, organization being like, you know what? Yeah. We, we, we need to lobby for this because Canada needs to have uh, have its maple syrup represented everywhere. Yeah, we need we need a maple syrup related emoji because why? It's 2015. Exactly. All right, well, let's jump into our top story. Facebook is testing a Snapchat-like feature in Messenger that lets you set messages to self-destruct in an hour. It's just in France for now, but Facebook has confirmed that the feature could be rolled out to other countries very soon. Once a message has been set for self-destruction, the, per the setting can be undone by the person who set it in the first place. You got an hour to do this. Uh, and I'm sure, Christina Warren, that the fact that this is a feature that is long associated with Snapchat is just a coincidence. Oh, I'm sure it's just a complete coincidence, just like all the other attempts that Facebook has tried to kind of copy Snapchat features. You know, um, you know what they say, uh, if they won't accept your offer to buy them like five times, then just try to recreate them. And, and considering that Snapchat's valuation has fallen significantly, maybe they can still have a chance to buy them. But uh, no, I mean, I think that, look, frankly, the ephemeral messaging part of Snapchat is something a lot of people like about it. But there's also something I think to be said about the fact that a lot of us who are not teens still have most of our contacts in something like Facebook Messenger. So bringing in that kind of self-destruct nature, I think it's a decent idea. I also think that having it set at an hour might be a little better than just the, you know, truly instantaneous me um, method of a snap, which is great for, for those particular contexts. And for certain things, you might not just, you just want to see for a second. But for other things, you know, maybe like if you're putting in sensitive information that isn't you know, that you don't want to exist on someone's phone after a certain period of time. I mean, this could be cool. And I'm curious about what the legal requirements are for businesses who want to use this. Of course, the government requires uh, hanging on to certain types of uh, data, like email data, for a certain sure. amount of time. So I'm wondering if this is a way around that or if this would be 
uh, illegal for certain types of companies, we'll have to see, I guess. I mean, honestly, if, if I'm being completely real with you, I think that, that we might have companies might have bigger concerns if real business is taking place over Facebook Messenger. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I'm just saying, I mean, like, like genuinely, like, like that's what things like Slack are for. Like, like Facebook has their Facebook for work kind of programs. And I know they've sort of dabbled in that, but genuinely like this is a consumer messaging product. So I wouldn't be too concerned about the, the, the business realities of this. And if you are the state department, you know, don't, don't let, just like you shouldn't let anybody have AOL email addresses in which they forward things to, you shouldn't let people. Yeah, stuff over. yeah, so yeah. AOL mess, AOL accounts. Uh, CIA Director John Brennan, don't Seriously. use <laughs> an AOL account for your personal use. <laughs> right. right, just don't. I mean, just, just don't. don't use AOL. Period. More news coming right up. But first, I want to talk about ZipRecruiter, one of our uh, sponsors today. ZipRecruiter. One of these days, I'm going to come in here by myself, lock the doors, and I'm going to do a three-day telethon so that I can go through all the features that uh, ZipRecruiter has for people who are hiring. Uh, it's the only way to hire because of all of the conveniences and uh, ways that ZipRecruiter saves you money. It's absolutely astounding. You simply post once, and with one click, off it goes to 100-plus uh, job sites, including social networks. So easy to do. You can send it to uh, paid job boards in seconds. You can enjoy the built-in social recruiting, which is so powerful. You can even automate the tweets that go out. And so people will start following your Twitter account to get uh, a, a first jump at the, the jobs that you post. Uh, you can discover candidates in their resume database. This resume database is enormous, and, and I like tracking its uh, growth. Right now, as of this morning, uh, there are 6,506,334 resumes and uh, thousands more coming in every single day and it's free to search uh, and you can get full talk contact information for 50 to a thousand resumes per month depending on your plan type very very powerful and you can embrace the mobile job seeker which uh which makes sure that uh, you can do all this stuff in a in a mobile friendly way so powerful so many features far more than i could ever touch on they even have lots of hr automation here now so if you've got a small company especially and, and you don't have an HR department, well, all you have to do is sign up for ZipRecruiter and you have an HR department. Dan is a happy ZipRecruiter client. We've got a testimonial from Dan. He wrote, the hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. And that is absolutely true. Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter so much for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's jump into our next <laughs> story. A refreshing and effervescent startup named Cola wants to replace endless text messaging back and forth with something they're calling Cola bubbles. I already like the sound of this, uh, Christina. Uh, wow. Anthony Ha yeah, wrote about the news for TechCrunch and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Hi, guys. How's it going? It's going great, thanks. Now, what is Cola's alternative to regular texting? What are Cola bubbles? So they're basically an attempt to build sort of like little interactive apps inside texting. So, for example, instead of texting back and forth and saying, hey, when are you free? I'm free at these times. Oh, I'm not free at these times. Um, you can actually open up your calendar within from the text messaging window, pick three like open windows, and then you'll just get um, the other person will just get, you know, these three options and they can pick one. And there's a similar thing for like your ETA, for polls, for to-do lists. So that sounds pretty cool. Um, and I like the idea that they're trying to integrate other aspects of your life into their messaging system. But there are already lots of messaging apps that kind of do that, maybe not quite in this way. Do you think that it is, there's still room for in this messaging category for an upstart when we are kind of facing not just the Facebook messengers and the WhatsApps and the Snapchats of the world, but also, you know, the WeChats and the lines and the kicks and all the others? Um, I think that potentially, I mean, certainly it's an uphill battle, right? Because I mean, there's everyone already probably has like multiple messaging apps that they use. Um, I think that then adding one more is potentially not a huge deal. Um, and I think that this is more focused sort of on productivity and on, you know, connecting and scheduling and those kinds of things than a lot of these other applications. And, and certainly the long-term vision is also then to start integrating uh, with other services. So it's not just, you know, building a few features themselves, but, you know, even though this is a super overused term, like genuinely turning it into a platform. 
And I'm sure they'd love to do that. You mentioned that you can do this from, you can get the calendar, for example, inside this app, then you can select things and so on. Is this uh, a specific calendar? Is this their calendar? It's, it's, is this it's Google. It's a, it'll be, a, it'll integrate with your, I think, your Google calendar initially. Um, and then over time, they, I think they want to add other calendars. But, but for now, I think it's Google. Very cool. Um, do you know anything? I mean, I, I was looking at at, at the, the startup, but the people who are behind this, this uh, behind Cola have some pretty impressive credentials. I see a lot of former Nest people, um, some former Apple people. Um, what do you th does having talked to them? Do, what does that say? Do you think about maybe their, their, their bigger visions for what this can be? Um, I think that it, it's a bunch of people that genuinely, even if you know, for now it seems like just another messaging app. It's it's a bunch of people who are, I think, pretty ambitious and think that this is really sort of the next kind of form of communication and are taking messaging really seriously. That doesn't guarantee success by any means. Sure. But I think that it implies that, you know, it's, they're not just, oh, this is a, kind of a fun messaging app, but actually we think this could be like really important for communication. And this could be potentially something, you know, really big down the road. So for people who are uh, listening to this and, and, and getting interested in using this, uh, is it possible for people to use this right now? How can people get this? Yeah, so they can get um, the Cola app off the App Store, and and or actually, let me. I'm sorry, you, you can you have to sign up, and then if for the private beta on the website, not off. It's not in uh, just you can't just download it. Um, I apologize. And then they're working on. Uh, I think you know Android is not yet come, but you can actually, if you have the app, you can send you know texts and um, links to bubbles. Um, to people who don't have the app. So it's not just for messaging with people who have the app, although, of course, it's going to be a lot more convenient if they have the app as well. All right. Well, Anthony Ha is at TechCrunch.com and on Twitter at Anthony Ha. Anthony, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Right, Bye-bye. Fossil Group yesterday announced the acquisition of Misfit for $260 million. Dan Graziano writes for CNET and joins us to explain what the heck's going on here. Welcome to the show, Dan. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Now, uh, Fossil, of course, is a watch company. Misfit is a, is a, a, a wearable, you know, a smart wearable. Why does Fossil want Misfit? Why don't they just continue uh, developing their own technology? So Fossil is in a really interesting position. They have competition coming from everywhere right now. They have competition from Apple, but they also have competition still from uh, Casio and Timex and other watchmakers because everything's expanding to the connected category. Uh, so buying Misfit will help them further compete with Apple and Fitbit and Jawbone and everyone. Um, yeah, you know, I have to say, when we found out this happened yesterday, Samantha Murphy Kelly, who does a lot of our wearable stuff, she, <laughs> hearing her exclaim, she was like, I was not expecting this. Um, because, uh, as you noted, I mean, obviously, Fossil, there's a lot of competition coming from all over the place, but, but Misfit has been doing a lot of things in the wearable space and, and with their different orbs and their, and their different um, features. What type of tech do you think Misfit brings to Fossil that maybe Fossil, even though they are definitely getting into the smart space, uh, doesn't already have um, internally? Uh, I think it's big on just the app platform itself. Mm -hmm. Fossil, so Fossil has two. I actually have one of them right here. It's uh, yeah. they have two watches: the Fossil Q Grant and Q Reveler, two activity trackers. And their app just is it. It's not as re uh, refined as say Jawbone or Fitbit. And Misfit does have an app platform that people like using. So it's kind of like an Accu hire. They're getting this great platform. Yeah. They're getting these engineers, and it's going to help help them in the future compete. What's going to happen to Misfit stuff? I mean, do you do you have they said are they going to continue to operate it as a band? Or are they going to continue because Misfit's had a fairly open platform, and that's been the thing is that you've been able to use it with Pebble, you've been able to use it with other companies, um, have, have had interactions with them. I, I can't necessarily imagine that Fossil would necessarily want um, competitor watches to also work with with Misfit. That yeah, that's a great question. Like you said, Pebble, uh, the Misfit apps on there, and it's a, it's a great option. But it's a great I, option. I, I, I'm also curious, too, is Fossil going to allow it to happen, or is it just going to be a Fossil watch? We'll have the Misfit app. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. They haven't said anything about that yet. Uh, Misfit has an interesting history. I believe that they were co-founded in Vietnam. Uh, and what is going to happen to Sunny Vu, who is the CEO of Misfit? So Sunny Vu is joining the executive team at Fossil. He will be, I believe, vice president. Uh, sorry president of the connected group uh, at Fossil. And it's interesting because also an investor was Xiaomi in Misfit. So Xiaomi, who's a major competitor to Fitbit, Misfit, and Fossil as well, is benefiting from this sale. 
All right. Well, Dan Graziano is at CNET.com and on Twitter at Dan Graziano. Dan, thanks for joining us today and telling us all about this, uh, this acquisition. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Right, Apple's HomeKit platform just got its first smoke alarm. First Alert launched its one-link smoke and carbon monoxide alarm with HomeKit integration yesterday. The detector mounts on a ceiling and alerts the special app on your phone when smoke or carbon monoxide are detected. The alarm also has a built-in nightlight that can be turned on or off with a phone. And HomeKit integration also means you can ask Siri to change the nightlight or, or tell whether you're, or not your house is burning down. <laughs> built-in battery in the $109 version lasts 10 years and a second version costs $119 and can be plugged in, and that one has a backup battery, But and that's also the virgin, version with the nightlight. The, the less expensive version does not have the nightlight. Christina Warren, this is great. Uh, now uh, iPhone and Apple fanboys can survive fires and uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, presumably they already have been able to do that with this simple carbon monoxide or smoke alarm. Uh, but yeah, now it's now it's connected. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Because obviously this is very similar to the Nest Protect. And um, I, I'm not, you know, but, but Nest obviously is, is Google, is not going to work with HomeKit and um, has, but, but it does have an iPhone app, I believe. So it, yep. it, I guess it'll be interesting to see how the two kind of compare. But I, I do like seeing... Um, this stuff um, uh, come out. Uh, I have gone through the the pain and turmoil of dealing with smoke alarms that go off for no reason, um, yeah. and, and living in a small apartment with with no fewer than four alarms. It can be annoying to shut them off. So, I mean, I like those features myself. But it's also good for just for alerting if you're out of the house, if you're in another place, to know, hey, if something's going on, you know, you might want to check this out. So, good stuff. Yeah, and I especially like the elimination that uh, I can look forward to someday when I eventually buy one of these products of the, you know, the battery alert when the battery starts going low. It starts, yes. you, know, you don't know which one it is because the, the... You don't know which one it is. And then what happens is, you know, this happened to me in my in my in my building. We legally like aren't allowed to change the the batteries in, in the ones in the hallway and, and the super took his sweet time changing it. And so we got to the point we got used to hearing the the little battery beep every 90 seconds or whatever. Finally someone and it was not me, I will point this out, although I consider doing this. <laughs> someone got a, a step ladder or something and just ripped the, the smoke alarm out of the ceiling um, in, in the hallway because you know, the, the super wouldn't change the battery. And uh, that was fine. I mean, a little unsafe until the fire marshal comes to ex and inspect. And I'm the only person home that day. And I get screamed at, you know, for no battery being there. And I'm like, really? Really? So having a 10-year battery life and, and or having an option that has a backup and has a nightlight, I would prefer that over the dumb uh, smoke alarms any day of the week because yeah. it's not fun getting yelled at by the New York um, fire department. And it's refreshing to see a consumer electronics product that's expected to last more than two years by the company right? that makes it. So. Uh, no, that okay, okay. Now you're bringing my one, one concern with this. It's great the battery lasts 10 years, but can we... Are they going to ensure app updates for 10 years? <laughs> like, you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And I imagine you you live in Brooklyn, right? So I imagine your building yeah. has, has it got one of those old school, like, uh, 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 what do you call it when you fire escape, where you have the ladder yes. that's come sliding down? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally one of those things. And, uh, yep, yep. I know you guys are used to that kind of thing, but out here in California, we don't have them, and I think they're really cool. Anyway. Oh, yeah, uh, no, I, they I, are really cool, but it's also really scary to be like, okay, how would I get out? And how? And then really what you're realizing is that the likelihood of something terrible happening is like, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be dead, basically. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, <laughs> we got some uh, product update news. <laughs> Twitter yesterday unveiled a new GIF format called Scratch Reel. It enables you to fast-forward or rewind by simply swiping across the image on a mobile a device or clicking and dragging in a mobile in a desktop browser. The format came with Twitter's acquisition uh, acquisition of Snappy TV in June of 2014. I don't even recall that acquisition, Christina Warren. I but this don't is, either. This is really cool. I really like it this. It is, is really a, cool. A real I like update. that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a real update. Now, what's going to be interesting will be to see, I think, that already that's available to anybody who's been on, like, the Snappy TV platform, whatever the hell that was. Who knows? <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I, I hope that they open this up to more people to be able to use them and create these GIFs. Um, because the one thing that is kind of annoying me about Twitter, they're doing all this great GIF stuff. Um, but, it, you know, they even have kind of their own kind of GIF platform that you can even create with your photos and stuff. But they're not opening it up to everyone. So, like, I want to be able to create these. You know, I, I, I want to be able to upload a GIF that will have this functionality. So, I hope they do that, too. Because this is great, being able to scrub back and forth. It especially, I mean, it works good on the desktop, but it's especially awesome on mobile. Yeah, it's just how uh, GIFs should work, I think. And so hopefully the, they'll make it a standard of some kind. We can all use it. All right, well, we have some more news coming right up. But first, I want to tell you about Braintree, uh, our second sponsor today. Braintree uh, is a simple payment solution if you've got a, a mobile website.
And if you're selling things, you have products and services, you need to take money. This is how you do it. It's the way Uber does it. It's the way lots and lots of unicorns uh, actually accept it. And I've talked a lot about how easy this makes payments for your customers. And that's super important. You don't want your customers wandering away with a bad feeling about what a confusing and difficult process it was to give you their money. You don't want that. And Braintree just eliminates that entire problem. But I, today I want to talk about how great it is and how easy it is and how fast it is and reliable it is for you as the app developer, as the, as the website, as the small business owner to integrate Braintree into your uh, website. A few lines of code and you're good to go with 130 currencies. You can take everything, all the credit cards, Apple Pay, Android Pay, Venmo, Bitcoin, uh, you name it, you can take it. Just, it just comes with Braintree integration. And uh, when you want to sign up, you can get up and running very, very quickly. You can uh, simply, you know, go to the site, uh, fill out the sign-up form, and then you'll be contacted probably in about a day, and you'll be up and running just very shortly after, after that. And um, after the transaction, at, after each transaction is processed, uh, you're going to get uh, the money very, very quickly. Uh, uh, two to four business days, you get the deposit very fast. And uh, they offer data portability. They protect you against fraud. And, uh, and they support all kinds of different languages, including Ruby, Python, Java, uh, Microsoft.net, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very flexible, very, very powerful. You have to use Braintree if you are taking payments online. You kind of have to be, you'd ha you have to be nuts to not do it. It's so great, solves all the problems associated with taking money online. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution support for all payment types your customers might want. Single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and super fast payouts. To check it out for yourself, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. In news you can lose, Google posted a photo on Google Plus yesterday showing one of Google's self-driving cars getting pulled over. The reason, the car was going too slow. No ticket was issued, though, because nobody was driving, I'm, I'm assuming. Google's <laughs> custom-built self-driving cars can't exceed 25 miles an hour for, quote, safety reasons, unquote. And the translation there is for PR reasons. Google says they want their cars to feel friendly and approachable rather than zooming scarily through neighborhood streets. Google was quick to point out that after 1.2 million miles of autonomous driving, no Google car has ever been given a ticket. Wow. Unbelievable. And, <laughs> and I don't know who took this picture, uh, but, uh, but it's kind of funny seeing a self-driving, a, a cop sitting there talking it to is. an empty seat. <laughs> no, I kind of love it where you're literally, he's like, all right, well, yeah. I, uh, please pull over for me. And the car pulls over, look, then, well, all right, Mr. Robot, uh, <laughs> how fast are you going there? It's like you're, you're waiting for, uh, for, for, for Google's voice assistant to then just start talking. It's right, the, the good voice assistant saying, what seems to be the problem, Ops? Well, what exactly. I don't understand is how does it, okay. how, does it well, how do you tell it to pull over? Yeah, I, 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 that's actually a really good question, right? I mean, maybe this is the whole thing with self-driving cars. It's like there might be instances where you're like, actually, okay, I need to pull over right now. It's like, do you have a button? Do you control it? I mean, what happens? Um, yeah. Right, and I wonder if it has a make a run for it mode for when you don't want to be pulled over. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Chase mode is what that's called. It's called chase mode, and, it, and it's what happens. It's And what I can imagine then is it was being like when you're playing Grand Theft Auto and you're trying to get five stars to get all the cops after you and just go as fast as you possibly can and, and have them chasing you in the self-driving car. But, uh, of course, in this case, since for PR reasons, as you know, they can only go 25 miles an hour. That would be a uh, pretty quick um, chase. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And of course, in a Tesla, it's called insane mode. If you want to escape yeah. the police, just hit that button and off you go. All right, we got some we got some email from a TNT fan named Richard Sims who said, in your show about the just released iPad Pro, there was a there was lament about the lack of a mouse for the iPad, citing awkward text handling. I was surprised that no one mentioned the nifty trackpad capability built in iOS 9. When you're in text, putting two fingers on the keyboard area causes the keyboard to go blank and trackpad capability to appear where you can precisely move to any point in the text and very easily select or operate on the text. And uh, that is a great point, Richard. I forgot about that one. And on the new iPhone 6S, that trackpad mode is enabled with force touch. So essentially, you just push hard and then you can move it around like it's a trackpad. Very powerful capability. Um, Christina Warren, have you been uh, using an iPad Pro? And if so, oh, of course you have. And, and yes. what, do you, what, do you, what do you think of it? 
Um, I like it. So I was trying to pull mine yeah. out and uh, see because I've got one, right? So. Just got one, right? Yeah, it's here somewhere. Just got one. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, yep. we have we have uh, we have an hour. We can do an unboxing. Yeah, and we can do an <laughs> unboxing. No, I just wanted to show off this. Yeah, it's, it's gold. gold. It's big. It's big it's, and gold. I mean, it's, it's yeah. really big. Yeah. No, I I haven't spent a ton of time with it to be honest. I got it yesterday. Um, and, uh, so and yesterday was my birthday. So I was doing more of that than I was playing with the iPad last night. Happy birthday. But no, it's, it's, thank you very much. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's huge. Um, and, uh, I kind of do agree with, I mean, uh, the, the lack of a mouse pointer thing that Lance Ulanoff mentioned that in, in his review too. But as, as Richard points out, having that, uh, you know, keyboard option is, is great. I really like the Apple pencil. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And I really like the, the Apple keyboard. I was actually surprised how much I liked how it feels. I wasn't expecting to, um, for it to feel as comfortable as it did. Uh, it, it's frankly better than I was expecting it to be. I still don't know if I'm ever going to be sold on like full on typing, on, uh, on that keyboard versus like a MacBook keyboard, but it's, it's better than I thought it would be. Um, but yeah, I mean, this thing is just so big. <laughs> it's just plain large. Very it's just cool. large. Very cool. All right, we got another email from Michael Delamar who said, it seems like the Comcast data cap could also have chilling implications for people using Tor and other routing-based uh, anonymous browsers. Tor only works if users agree to be a hub for other users' traffic to be routed through. If users are charged for the extra data they use, I doubt they'll be able to act as a Tor hub on the network. Love the show. Keep up the great work. And that is an interesting point that I hadn't yeah. considered. I really don't know how much traffic is involved in being a Tor data hub. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of times it sort of depends. And, and obviously, I mean, I think that a lot of times what you're using Tor for is different than what you would use a typical VPN for. So you might use a VPN, you know, for, for media stuff or for, for other reasons, whereas Tor is is about wanting to kind of protect what, what you're doing, um, which is typically why Tor isn't as fast as some other options. But yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting point. Um, it's also interesting in, in that how all of uh, Comcast and and there's also Time Warner and, and Optimum and there are other companies out there that have these like uh, almost like these nationwide Wi-Fi networks. How those actually work is that you know you're sharing Wi-Fi um, if you're using the the uh, cable company's uh, router, then it's got like two modes. So it's got like you know the the mode where it's just for you and your house, and then it's the mode that will kind of be open to the public uh, that kind of creates like a mesh network if you're also a subscriber. So uh, it. It is sort of a. It's interesting. It'd be interesting to see if Tor would somehow. And I doubt any of the any of the ISPs would agree with this. But if they could kind of take advantage of some of those mesh networks that are out there, um, and then it wouldn't necessarily impede on your on your data cap. But I, I think that that it's probably for people who are using Tor. I wouldn't be. I would never for instance, say, don't use Tor because if you're a Comcast user or somebody else who has data caps, you're going to blow through your data that way. I, I think that that seems a little. Um, uh, spurious, but it's definitely something to think about. Yeah, it definitely is. And I do not like the Comcast uh, data cap. It yeah. punishes early adopters. It punishes it people with 4K TVs. I just don't like it at all. No, I, I don't like it either. And I also I think a lot of it kind of does go against very core net neutrality things, which is that, you know, they won't count it if you're using the you know, Xfinity Go app on your Xbox, that doesn't count towards your cap, right? So if I watch a TV show in Xfinity, then it doesn't count towards my cap. But if I watch the exact same show over the same connection in Netflix than it does. And like, that's, that's aggravating. And that's yeah. when I get a little bit, you know, ups, upset. I'm fortunate enough that my uh, ISP, and again, this is my big problem with, with how all this stuff works. I don't have a choice in who my ISP is. I'm very fortunate my my ISP is not only same when it comes to not having caps, but will even for the amount of money we pay, lets us run a server out of our house and like gives us like, like genuinely, like they're like, oh, you can have your own, you can have your own home server set up. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, but most ISPs aren't like that. And and Comcast, with their data caps, especially as they're moving people towards wanting to do more and more content online and, and more of us are starting to get all of this over, over the internet, it's like having these caps which are arbitrary completely. It's like bad enough the speeds aren't good enough. And now you're going to say, well, if you put up with what our speeds are, you can only use this much. And, and like you said, uh, that 4K, you know, content, which there's not a lot of anywhere, like, just wait until we start to get 4K content, and it's like, really? I, I watch, you know, three movies, and then and they're going to be like, well, now you're halfway through your data cap for the month. And it's like, really, really? That's probably what they're saying at Comcast. Ooh, just wait until we get 4K content. Oh, right. we're going to make so much money. All right, we got we another make email. So much money. Exactly. <clears throat> we got another email from uh, Jim Kaler, who said, "I'd like to disclose a bug I found in the iPhone 6s Plus for all versions of iOS 9." 
This bug is a conflict between the camera app and any podcast or music app. With the new iPhone 6S Plus, it's not possible to take a still picture and listen to the podcast or music at the same time. Thanks for your excellent podcast. And my reply to Jim is that uh, uh, the, uh, to point out that Jim went on to confirm the bug at the Apple store and the genius bartender there told him to simply report the bug. Personally, I think this is uh, almost certainly related to the live photos feature because, of course, if you've got live photos turned on, right. it makes a video with sound. It's actually recording sounds. So yes. Of course, you can't be playing music. while. You, and then if you turn it off, it still has the same behavior. But that sounds to me, Christina, like... That's just Apple being consistent as they tend to do. Yeah, um, that's a weird one. And that's, I mean, I think that that's a, that, that's a great edge case that, that he uh, figured out. I hope that he's submitted this to Apple or if he hasn't, then somebody watching the show, if you can confirm that this is the case, file a radar. If you don't, maybe I will. But um, you meaning people in the audience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that that's a tough thing to, to kind of solve because you're right. The live photos thing is obviously going to want to capture the audio for a second and a half before and after the photo is being taken. Um, but I think that you could very easily have something uh, programmed to say if music is already playing, you know, live photo equals off. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be a good that'd be a good way to do it. Uh, we'll that, that, I mean, that, that it could just naturally do that. Like you wouldn't yeah. even have to have a setting like that would just be like, you know, a function as, as part of how this stuff works, which would say, you know, it basically the, the operating system would query and say if, you know, music is playing, then the live photo thing won't work. And, and that would that would solve the problem if, if if the reason that that's happening is is as you say um be, because of the, the microphone um uh you know trying to work at the same time that the sound is being played out yeah and, and we'll see if other people complain if they get enough complaints i'm sure they'll do something well our tnt fan of the day is edward sesconetto from houston who posted this video on twitter he said he was listening to tnt and he had to stop listening to film this uber mapping car in katy texas and there it wow. is, the Uber mapping car. This is uh, nice. I've never seen one in the I wild myself. You got to go to you got to go to Texas to see it. And there it is, very cool. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. And please use the hashtag How I Watch TNT so we can find it. Christina Warren, what are you up to these days? Well, I mean, you know, I, uh, I just got the iPad Pro, so I'm playing around with that. I'm also working on a story today, just kind of delving into some of the um, uh, security uh, certificate uh, brouhaha yeah. that happened with the Mac App Store and, and kind of writing a bigger think piece about what it means for us who are encouraging everybody to all regular users to care so much about security and, and using SSL connections when um, companies can't actually get their ish together and uh, make sure that those <laughs> things are not compromised or that they don't expire. All right. Well, Christina Warren, thank you so much for co-anchoring today. And Thanks, good luck Mike. on all of that. And have fun with the pancake emoji when it emerges officially. And uh, thank you so much for co-anchoring. We'll see you next week. See you next week, right. Mike. Bye-bye. Let us know what's on your mind. Send email to tnt at twit.tv. Or you can call us at 260-TNT-SHOW. That's 260-868-7469. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on your favorite social media site, tag three friends, and recommend that they subscribe. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TV. And you can follow me at elgin.com. Don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthus and edited by Kevin King. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday.